Capitol of Black Recordings is pleased to present an unabridged recording of With More at Karuna by G. A. Henty. Chapter 4 Under Canvas In a short time, O'Grady returned, followed by Hulan carrying a small barrel of wine. It is good, I hope, the Major said as the barrel was set down in one corner of the room. I think that is the best that they have. One of the girls went down with Tim into the cellar and pointed it out to him. I told him to ask her for Bueno Vino. I don't know whether it was right or wrong, but I think she understood. How much does it hold, O'Grady? I cannot say. Five or six gallons, I should think, anyhow. I paid three dollars for it. You must put down all the outgoings, O'Grady, and we will square up when we leave here. I will put them down, Major. How long do you think we shall stop here? That is more than anyone can say. We have to wait for Anstruther and Spencer. It may be three or four days. It may be a fortnight. Dick Ryan assisted Terence in the cooking, while Tim went down to get something to drink out of. He returned with three mugs and two horns. Divil a thing else is there that can be found, Your Honor, he said as he placed them on the table. Every martial thing is in use. That will do to begin with, the Major said. We will get our own things up this afternoon. We must manage as best we can for this meal. It is better than I expected by a long way. Tim now relieved the two young officers at the gridiron, and sitting down at benches along the table, the meal was eaten with much laughter and fun. After all, there is nothing like getting things straight from the gridiron, the Major said. O'Grady had got the bung out of the barrel and filled the five drinking vessels, and the wine was pronounced to be very fair. One by one, other officers dropped in, and Hulan was for an hour kept busy. The Major, who spoke a little Spanish, went down and returned with a dozen bottles of spirits, two or three of which were opened and the contents consumed. It is poor stuff by the side of whiskey, O'Grady said as he swallowed a stiff glass of it. Still, I will not be denying it is warm and comforting. If we can get enough of it, we can hold on till we get home again. Here is success to the campaign. I will trouble you for that bottle, O'Driscoll. Here it is. I shall stick to wine. I don't care for that fiery stuff. Here is success to the campaign, and may we meet the French before long. We are pretty sure to do that, he went on as he set his horn down on the table. If Junot knows his business, he won't lose a day before marching against us directly he hears of our landing. He will know well enough that unless he crushes us at once, he will have all Portugal up in arms. Here, Terence, you can have this horn. The difficulty of drinking had to some extent been solved by Hulan, who had gone downstairs and returned with a tin pot capable of holding a bout of couple of quarts. This he had cleaned by rubbing it with sand and water, and it went round as a loving cup among those unprovided with mugs or horns. When all had finished, the two soldier servants, who had now arrived with the rations, were left in charge. Old Driscoll's servant had brought in a dozen fowls and a large basket full of eggs, and, ordering supper to be ready at eight, the officers returned to their camp. They found that their comrades had done fairly well. Several rooms had been attained in the village, and hams, black sausages, and other provisions purchased and cooked in a rough way on a gridiron. I'm afraid that is too good to last, the colonel said as the officers gathered around him as the bugle sounded for parade. A week of this and the last scrap of provisions here will have been eaten, and we shall have nothing but our rations to fall back upon. There is one thing, however, that is not likely to give out. That is wine. They grow it about here, and I hear that the commissariat have bought up large quantities without difficulty to serve out to the troops. The regiment had a long afternoon's drill to get them out of the slackness occasioned by their enforced idleness on the voyage. When it was over, they were formed up, and the colonel addressed a few words to the men. Men of the Mayo Regiment, he said. I trust that, now we are fairly embarked upon the campaign, you will so behave as to do credit to yourselves and to Ireland. Perhaps some of you think that, 
Now that you are on campaign, you can do just as you like. Those who think so are wrong. It is just the other way. When you were at home, I did not think it necessary that I should be severe with you. And as long as a man was able, when he came into barracks, to walk to his quarters, I did not trouble about him. But it is different here. Any breach of duty will be most severely punished, and any man who is found drunk will be flogged. Any man plundering or ill-treating the people of this country will be handed over to the provost marshal, and, unless I am mistaken, he is likely to be shot. Sir Arthur Wellesley is not the man to stand nonsense. There must be no straggling. You must keep within the bounds of the camps, and no one must go into the village without a permit from the captain of his company. As to your fighting, well, I have no fear of that. We shall say nothing about it. Before the enemy, I know you will all do your duty. And it is just as necessary that you should do your duty and be a credit to your regiment at other times. There are blackguards in the regiment as there are in every other. But I tell them that a sharp eye will be kept upon them, and that no mercy will be shown upon them if they misbehave while they are in Portugal. That is all I have to say to you. That was the sort of thing, I think, Major, he said, as after the men were dismissed, he walked back to his tent with Major Harrison. Just the sort of thing, Colonel, the other said, smiling, and said in the sort of way that they will understand. I'm afraid that we shall have trouble with some of them. Wine and spirits are cheap, and it will be very difficult to keep them from it altogether. Still, if we make an example of the first fellow who is caught drunk, it will be a useful lesson to the whole. A few floggings at the start may have some hanging afterwards. I know you are averse to flogging. There have only been four men flogged in the last six months. But this is a case where punishment must be dealt out sharply if discipline is to be maintained. And the credit of the regiment be kept up. O'Grady and one of the other officers called upon the priest to thank him for his good offices in obtaining the room for them. I'm afraid from what my man tells me that he did not state the case quite fairly to you. Our regiment was, as he said, raised in Ireland, and the greater portion of the men are naturally of your faith, father. But we really have no claim to your services, whatever. The priest smiled. I am nevertheless glad to have been of service to you, gentlemen, he said courteously. At least you are Irishmen, and I have many good friends, countrymen of yours, and you have still another claim upon us all. For are you not here to aid us to shake off this French domination? I hope that you are comfortable, but judging from what I see and hear when passing, I fear that your lodging is a somewhat noisy one. You may say that, father, and we will do our full share towards making it so. But having the room makes all the difference to us. They have no time to cook downstairs, and it is done by our own servants. But it is handy to have the wine and other things within call. And if we always do as well, we shall have good cause to feel mighty contented. For, barring that we are rather crowded, we are just as well off here as we were at home, saving only in the quality of the spirits. Now, Father, we cannot ask you up there, seeing that it is your own village. But if you would like to take a walk through the camps, we should be glad to show you what there is to be seen, and give you a little of the real crater. It is not much of it that we have been able to bring ashore, for the general is mighty stiff in the matter of baggage. But I doubt whether there is one of us who did not manage to smuggle a bottle or two of the real stuff hidden in his kit. The priest accepted the invitation and was taken through the brigade camp, staying some time in that of the mayos and astonishing some of the soldiers by chatting to them in English, and with a brogue almost as strong as their own. He then spent half an hour in O'Grady's tent and sampled the whiskey, which he pronounced excellent and of which his entertainer insisted upon his taking a bottle away with him. Three days later, it was known in camp that two French divisions had been sent in motion against them, the one for Abrantes to the east under Leosin, the other from the south under Le Bord. Junot himself remained at Lisbon. The rising in the south and the news of the British landing caused an intense feeling among the population and the French general feared that at any moment an insurrection might break out. The natural point of junction of these two columns would be at Liera. That night, orders were issued for the tents of the division to which the Mayo regiment belonged to be struck before daylight. 
and the troops were to be under arms and ready to march at six o'clock. Good news, O'Grady said as he entered the mess room at four o'clock in the afternoon, after having learned from the colonel the orders for the next morning. Our brigade is to form the advance guard, and we are to march at six tomorrow. A general exclamation of pleasure broke from the five or six officers present. We shall have the first of the fun, boys. Hand me that horn, Terence. Here is to Sir Arthur. Good luck to him, and bad cess to the French. The toast was drunk with some laughter. Now we are going to campaign in earnest, he went on. No more wine spilling, no more devil ham. No more spirits, old Grady, one of the group cut in. And as for the wine, you have drunk your share, besides twice your share of the spirits. Within there, there is nothing to do, Demon Ham. I could take me liquor in moderation. I have never remarked that, O'Grady, one of the others put in. In great moderation, O'Grady said gravely, but he was again interrupted by a shout of laughter. Ye had to be helped home last night, O'Grady, and it took Hoolan a quarter of an hour to wake you this morning. I heard him say, My master, dear, the bugle will sound in a minute or two. It's wake you must, or there will be a devil of a botheration over it. I looked in, and there you were. Hoolan was standing by the side of you shaking his head gravely, as if it was a hopeless job that he had in hand. And if I had not emptied a water bottle over you, you would never have been on parade in time. Oh, it was you, was it? O'Grady said wrathfully. Hoolan swore by all the saints that he had not seen who it was. Never mind me, boy. I will be even with you yet. The O'Grady is not to be waked in that fashion. Mind, I owe you one, though I'm not saying that I should have been on parade in time if you had not done it. I only just saved my bacon. And hardly that, Terence laughed, for the adjutant was down upon you pretty sharply. Your coat tee was all buttoned up wrong, your hair had not been brushed, and stuck up all ways below your shako. Your sword belt was all awry, and you looked worse than you did when I brought you home. Well, it is a poor heart that never rejoices, Terence. We must make a night of it, boys. If the tents are to be struck before daylight, it will be mighty little use of your turning in. You won't catch me sitting up all night, Terence said, with perhaps a twenty-mile march in the morning, and maybe a fight at the end of it. If it is to Liera where we're going, it'll be nearer thirty miles than twenty. And even you, seasoned vessel as you are, will find it a long walk after being up all night and having had pretty hard work today. I cannot hold with the general there, O'Grady said gravely. He has been caping us all at it from daybreak till night, every day since we landed, and marching the men's feet off. It is all very well to march when we have got to march, but to keep us tramping fifteen or twenty miles a day when there is no occasion for it is out of all reason. We shall march all the better for it tomorrow, O'Grady. It has been hard work, certainly, but not harder than it was marching down to Cork, and we should have a good many stragglers tomorrow if it had not been for the last week's work. We have got half a dozen footsore men in my company alone, and you would have fifty tomorrow night if the men had not had all this marching to get them fit. It is all very well for you, Terence, who have been tramping all over the hills round Athlone since you were a goosen, but I am sure that if I had not had that day off duty when I showed the priest round the camp, I should have been killed. Here is the general order of the day, the adjutant said as he came in with Captain O'Connor. The general says that now the army is about to take the field. He shall expect the strictest discipline to be maintained, and that all stragglers from the ranks will at once be handed over to the provost marshal, and all offenses against the peasantry or their property will be severely punished. Then there are two or three orders that do not concern us particularly, and then there is one that concerns you, Terence. The general has received a report from Colonel Corcoran of the Mayo Fusiliers, stating that the transport carrying the left wing of the regiment was attacked by two French privateers and would have been compelled to surrender, she being particularly unarmed, had it not been for the coolness and quick wit of Ensign Terence O'Connor. Having read the report, the general commanding fully concurs, 
and expresses his high satisfaction at the conduct of Ensign O'Connor, which undoubtedly saved from capture the wing of the regiment. There, Terence, that is a feather in your cap. Sir Arthur is not given the praise unduly, and it is seldom that an ensign gets into general orders. It will do you good some day, perhaps when you least expect it. I am heartily pleased, my lad, Captain O'Connor said as he laid his hand upon Terence's shoulder. I am proud of you. I have never seen my own name in general orders, but I am heartily glad to see yours. Bedad, when I think that a couple of months ago you were running wild and getting into all sorts of mischief. It seems hard to believe that you should not only be one of us, but have got your name into general orders. And all for nothing, father, Terence said. I call it a beastly shame that just because I thought of using that lugger I should be cracked up more than the others. It was not only that, though Terence, those guns that crippled the lugger could not have been fired if you had not thought of putting the rope round them, and that French frigate would never have left you alone had you not suggested to the Major how to throw dust into their eyes. No, my lad, you thoroughly deserve the credit that you have got, and I am sure that there is not a man in the regiment who would not say the same. Gentlemen, Captain O'Grady said solemnly, we will drink to the health of Ensign Terence O'Connor. More power to his elbow, and the toast was duly honored. It is mighty good of me to propose it, O'Grady went on after Terence had said a few words of thanks, because I have a strong idea that in another two or three minutes I should have made just the same suggestion that you did, me lad. I knew at the time that there was just a plan I wanted to propose, but subtle a word came to my lips. I was just brimful with it, when you came up and took the words out of my mouth. If I had spoken first, it is a brevet majority I had got, sure enough. You must be quicker next time, O'Grady, the adjutant said when the laughter had subsided. As you say, you have missed a good thing by your slowness. I am afraid your brain was still a little muddled by your indulgence the night before. Just to the contrary, me boy. I feel that if I had taken just one glass more of the crater, my brain would have been clearer, and I should have been to the fore. But I bear you no malice, Terence. Maybe the ideas would not have managed to straighten themselves out until after we have had to haul down the flag, and then it would have been too late to have been any good. It has happened to me more than once before that I have just thought of a good thing when it was too late. It has occurred to most of us, O'Grady. Captain O'Connor said, laughing. Terence, you see, doesn't care for whiskey, and perhaps that has had something to do with his ideas coming faster than ours. Well, so we are off tomorrow, though, of course, no one knows which way we are going to march. It must be either to Lyra or along the coast road. It is a good thing Spencer has come up in time, for there is no saying how strong the French may be though I fancy they are all so scattered about that after leaving a garrison to keep Lisbon in order and holding other points, Junot will hardly be able, at such short notice, to gather a force much superior to ours. But from what I hear, there are many strong positions between this and Lisbon, and if he sticks himself up on the top of a hill, we shall have all our work to turn him off again. I fancy it will be to Lyria the adjutant said. The Portuguese report that one French division is at Candieros and another coming from Abrantes, and Sir Arthur is likely to endeavor to prevent them from uniting. That evening there was a grand feast at the mess room. The colonel had been specially invited, and every effort was made to do honor to the occasion. Tim Hoolan had been very successful in a foraging expedition and had brought in a goose and four ducks, and had persuaded the landlord's nieces to let him and the cook have sole possession of the kitchen. The banquet was a great success, but the majority of those present did not sit very long afterwards. The colonel set the example of rising early. I should advise you gentlemen to turn in soon, he said. I do not say where we are to march tomorrow, but I can tell you at least that the march is a very long one, and that it were best to get as much sleep as possible for I can assure you that it will be no child's play, and I think that it is quite probable 
we shall smell powder before the day is over. Accordingly, all the young officers and several of the seniors left with him, but O'Grady and several of the hard drinkers kept it up until midnight, observing, however, more moderation than usual in their potations. There was none of the grumbling common when men are turned out of their beds before dawn. All were in high spirits that the time for action had arrived. The men were as eager to meet the enemy as were their officers, and the tents were all down and placed in the wagons before daylight. The regimental cooks had already been at work, and the officers went round and saw that all had, had breakfast before they fell in. At six o'clock, the whole were under arms, and in their place as the central regiment in the brigade, they tramped on without a halt until eleven. Then the bugle sounded, and they fell out for half an hour. The men made a meal from bread and the meat that had been cooked the night before, each man carrying three days' rations in his haversack. There was another halt, and a longer one, at two o'clock when the brigade rested for an hour in the shade of a grove. It is mighty pleasant to rest, O'Grady said as the officers threw themselves down on the grass. But it is the starting that bates one. I feel that my feet have swollen so that every step I take, I expect my boots to burst with an explosion. Faith, if it comes to fighting, I shall take them off altogether and swing them at my belt. How can I run after the French when I'm a cripple? You better take your boots off now, O'Grady, one of the others suggested. It is not easy to get them off. And how should I get them on again? No, they have got there, and there they have got to stop. Bad cess to them. I told Hulin to rub grease into them for an hour last night, but the rascal was drunk as an owl. There was no more talking, for every man felt that an hour's sleep would do wonders for him. Soon absolute quiet reigned in the grove, and continued until the bugle again sounded them to their feet. All knew now that it was Liera that they were making for, and that another ten miles still remained to be accomplished. A small body of cavalry, which accompanied them now, pushed on ahead, and when half the distance had been traversed, a trooper brought back the news that the enemy had not yet reached the town. It was just six o'clock when the brigade marched in, amid the cheers and wild excitement of the inhabitants. The wagons were not yet up, and the troops were quartered in the town, tired, and many of them footsore, but proud of the march they had accomplished, and that it had enabled them to forestall the French. Le Bourg, indeed, arrived the same night at Batalha, eight miles distant, but on receiving the news in the morning that the British had already occupied Liera, he advanced no farther. His position was an exceedingly difficult one. His orders were to cover the march of Loison from Abrantes and form a junction with that general, but to do so now would be to leave open the road through Alcobaca and Obidos to the commanding position at Torres Vedras. Batalha offered no position that he could hope to defend until the arrival of Loison. Therefore, sending word to that general to move from Torres Novas as soon as he reached that town to Santarem and then to march to join him at Rolisa. He fell back to Alcobaca and then to Abidos, a town with a Moorish castle built on a gentle eminence in the middle of a valley. Leaving a detachment there, he retired to Rolisa, six miles to the south of it. At this point, several roads met, and he at once covered all the approaches to Torres Vedras, and the important port of Peniche, and could be joined by Loison marching down from Santarem. The advance brigade of the British force remained in quiet possession of Liria, during the next day, and on the following, the 11th of August, the main body of the army arrived, having taken two days on the march. The Portuguese force also came in under Frie. That general at once took position of the magazines there, and although he had promised the English general that their contents should be entirely devoted to the maintenance of the English army, he divided them among his own force. Disgusted as the British commander was at his barefaced dishonesty, he was not in a position to quarrel with the Portuguese. It was essential to him that they should accompany him, not for the sake of the assistance that they would give, for he knew that 
none was to be expected from them, but from a political point of view. It was most important that the people at large should feel that their own troops were acting with the British, and that no feelings of jealousy or suspicion of the latter should arise. Frye was acting under the orders of the Bishop and Junta of Oporto, whose great object was to keep the Portuguese army together and not to risk a defeat, as they desired to keep this body intact in order that, if the British were defeated, they should be able to make favorable terms for themselves. Consequently, even after appropriating the whole of the stores and provisions found at Lierje, Freye continued to make exorbitant demands and to offer a vigorous opposition to any further advance. So far did he carry this that the British general, finding that in no other way could he get the Portuguese to advance with him, proposed that they should follow behind him and wait the result of the battle, to which Freye at last consented. The Portuguese, in fact, had no belief whatever that the British troops would be able to withstand the onslaught of the French, whom they regarded as invincible. Colonel Trant, however, one of our military agents, succeeded in inducing Freire to place 1,400 infantry and 250 cavalry under the command of Sir Arthur. The addition of the cavalry was a very useful one, for the British had with them only 180 mountain men. The country was entirely new to them. Scarcely an officer could speak the language, and there was no means, therefore, of obtaining information as to the movements of the enemy. Moving forward through Bataha and regaining the coast road at Alcobaca, the British forces arrived at Caldas on the 15th, and on the same day, Junot quitted Lisbon with a force of 2,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, and 10 pieces of artillery, leaving 7,000 to garrison the forts and keep down the population of the city. His force was conveyed to Villa Franca by water, and the general then pushed forward to Santarem, where he found Loison and took command of his division. The British advance guard, after arriving at Caldas, pushed forward, drove the French pickets out of Brillo, and then from Obidos. Here, however, a slight reverse took place. Some companies of the 95th and 60th Rifles pressed forward three miles further in pursuit, when they were suddenly attacked and flanked by a greatly superior force. And had it not been that General Spencer, whose division was but a short distance behind, pressed forward to their assistance, they would have suffered heavily. As it was, they escaped with the loss of two officers and 27 men killed and wounded. Their rashness, however, led to the discovery that Le Bourde's forces had taken up a strong position in front of the village of Rolisa, and that he apparently intended to give battle there. The next day was spent in reconnoitering the French position. It was a very strong one. Rolisa stood on a tableland rising in a valley, affording a view of the road as far as Obido. The various points of defense there, and on the flank, were held by strong parties of the enemy. A mile in the rear was a steep and lofty ridge that offered a strong second line of defense. By the side of this ridge, the road passed through a deep defile and then mounted over a pass through the range of hills extending from the sea to the Tagus, and occupying the intermediate ground until close to Lisbon. Le Bourde's position was an embarrassing one. If he retired upon Torres Vedras, his line of communication with Loison would be lost, and if he moved to meet Loison, he would leave open the direct road to Lisbon, while if he remained at Rolisa, he had to encounter a force almost three times his own strength. Trusting in the advantages of his position and confident in the valor of his troops, he chose the last alternative. Very anxiously during the day, the British officers watched the French line of defense, fearful lest the enemy would again retreat. By sunset, they came to the conclusion that Le Bourde intended to stay where he was and to meet them. The French indeed had been so accustomed to beat the Spanish and Portuguese that they had now woke up to the fact that they had troops of a very different material facing them. We ought to have easy work, Major Harrison said as the officers gathered round the fire that had been built in front of the colonel's tent. The people here all declare that Le Bourde has not above 5,000 troops with him, 
while counting trans Portuguese, we have nearly 14,000. There will be no credit in thrashing them with such odds as that, Dick Ryan grumbled. I suppose, Ryan, Major Harrison said, if you had been in Sir Arthur's place, you would have preferred remaining at Lyria until Junot could have gathered all his forces and obtained a reinforcement of some 50,000 or so from Spain. Then you would have issued a general order saying that as the enemy had now a 100,000 troops ready, the army would advance and smite them. Not so bad as that, Major, the young ensign said, coloring as there was a general laugh from the rest. But there does not seem much satisfaction in thrashing an enemy when there are three to one against him. That is just the art of war, Ryan. Of course, it is glorious to defeat a greatly superior army and to lose half your own in doing so. That may be heroic, but it is not modern war. The object of a general is, if possible, to defeat an enemy in detail and so to maneuver that he is always superior in strength to the force that is immediately in front of him, and so to ensure victory after victory until the enemy are destroyed. That is what the general is doing by his skillful maneuvering. He is preventing Junot from massing the whole of the army of Portugal against us. Tomorrow we shall defeat Laborde, and doubtless, a day or two later we shall fight Loison. Then I suppose we shall advance against Lisbon, Junot will collect his beaten troops and his garrison. There will be another battle, and then we shall capture Lisbon, and the French will have to evacuate Portugal. Whereas, if all the French were at Rolisa, they would probably smash us into a crooked hat, in spite of any valor we might show. And as we have no cavalry to cover a retreat, as the miserable horses can scarcely drag the few guns that we have got, and the carriages are so rickety that the artillery officers are afraid that as soon as they fire them, they will shake to pieces. It is not probable that a single man will regain our ships. Please say no more, Major. I see I was a fool. Still, Captain O'Connor said, you must own, Major, that one does like to win against odds. Quite so, O'Connor. Individuals who may survive such a battle no doubt would be glad that it was a superior force that they had beaten. But then, you see, battles are not fought for the satisfaction of individuals. Moreover, you must remember that the proportion of loss is much heavier when the numbers are pretty equally matched. For in that case, they must meet to a certain extent face to face. Skill on the part of the general may do a great deal, but in the end, it must come to sheer hard fighting. Now I expect that tomorrow. Although there may be hard fighting, it is not upon that Sir Arthur will principally rely for turning the French out of those strong positions. He will, no doubt, advance directly against them, with perhaps half his force, but the rest will move along the top of the heights, and so threaten to cut the French line of retreat altogether. Le Bourde is, they say, a good general, and therefore will wait until he is caught in a trap, but will fall back as soon as he sees that the line of retreat is seriously menaced. I fancy, too, that he must expect Loison up some time tomorrow, or he would hardly make a stand. And if Loison does come up, Ryan's wish will be gratified, and we shall be having the odds against us. Then you must remember that our army is a very raw one. A large proportion of it is newly raised, and though there may be a few men here who fought in Egypt, the great bulk have never seen a shot fired in earnest. While well, on the other hand, the French have been fighting all over in Europe. They are accustomed to victory, and are confident in their own valor and discipline. Our officers are as raw as our men, and we must expect that all sorts of blunders will be made at first. I could tell you that I am very well satisfied that our first battle is going to be fought with the odds greatly on our side. In six months, I shall feel pretty confident, even if the French had the same odds on their side. The Major gave it you rather hotly, Dick, Terence said to his friend as they sauntered off together from the group. I am glad that you spoke first, for I had it on the tip of my tongue to say just what you did, and I expect that a good many others felt the same. Yes, I put my foot in it badly, Terence. I have no doubt that the Major was right anyhow. I have nothing to say against it, but for all that, I wish that either we were not so strong or that they were stronger. What credit is there, I should like to know, in thrashing them when we are three to one? Anyhow, I hope that we shall share in the scrimmage. 
We shall get an idea when the orders are published tonight, and shall see where Fane's brigade is to be put. Thank you for listening to Capitol Black Recordings. I hope you have enjoyed this recording of With More at Karuna by G.A. Henty. <laughs>